everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I don't think I've ever had a playwright on this show before, although I've talked about theater in the past. Um, but the other day, I saw a new play uh, premiering on uh, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, day before Ash Wednesday. Um, a new play published by the small Catholic press, Wise Blood Books. The play is called Sone Le Matina. It's set on Mardi Gras, interestingly, and uh, it's a very interesting premise in which a young uh, Ignatius of Loyola, Jean Calvin, and Francois de Rabelais are together on Mardi Gras and uh, come across a dead body and have to figure out what to do about it. Um, so I'm very happy to have the playwright with me today, Jane Clark Charles, and we'll be talking about this play. And uh, I don't really know much about her background uh, besides this work, so I'm, I'm excited to learn more about her uh, as a poet as well. Jane, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thomas. I'm excited to be here. And what does the title actually mean in English? So it, it means um, morning bells are ringing is how it's usually translated or matins bells are ringing. It's the last line from a French song, Frere Jaca, which it's a children's ah. song. You probably know it. Yeah. If you heard it sung, you'd say, oh, I know that. But it's actually a counter-reformation song. Um, and it it translates to, are you sleeping, Brother John? Morning bells are ringing, ding, ding, dong. And it means it was saying, come on, church monks, priests, are you sleeping? Look what's happening. Morning bells are ringing. Get up. Save the church. Um, but now it's just sung as sort of a playful little children's song. So that it was my husband's idea to name it that. So props to him. <laughs> nice. Let's just start with the premise of this play. Um, what? How did you come up with the idea of putting these three seemingly very different characters together um, for a dramatic piece? Yeah, so I came up with this idea in Paris. Well, my husband and I traveled to Paris in 2017. And while we were there, we learned that Ignatius of Loyola and John Calvin, they studied together in a small college in the Sorbonne um, under Erasmus, actually, um, at mm. the same time in the 1520s. They overlapped a little tiny bit. And then Francois Rabelais was kind of just wandering around France at this point. And he's a little difficult to trace at that point in his life because he's always he was always a little bit in trouble. So you we're never quite sure where he was. So I just thought it would be really fun to put those three characters in their sort of their pre-famous years together and see what happened if all of them in sort of their immature forms were interacting in the middle of a crisis. In an original formulation, Erasmus was there as well. Um, but he was a little bit, because he was older and had a position of authority, he became pretty pedantic. And I wanted the three of them to kind of be at the same moral and maturity level. So that's how it all started. And then um, it just sort of went from there. Yeah, interesting. Um, so maybe actually my listeners will know who St. Ignatius is. They'll know vaguely who John Calvin is at the very least. Maybe not as many of them, uh, including myself, know yeah. much about Rabelais. So could you tell us a little bit about where these these characters find themselves and specifically who is Rabelais? Sure. So Francois Rabelais was a Renaissance humanist novelist, and he's just one of the most fascinating characters in world literature. And I'm I'm not saying that. That's not an exaggeration. Sort of the, the greatest critics and literary minds since Rabelais have looked at him with awe, but he has lost a lot of his popular appeal. So when he first started writing, his books were incredibly popular. Everybody was reading them. Everyone was talking about them. And then within about 100, 150 years, he'd sort of dropped off, which is really intriguing. He, he almost followed the same trajectory as Miguel de Cervantes, but Cervantes' novel, is it has a little bit more of a, of a modern plot arc. Um, so mm -hmm. people could still read Don Quixote and sort of be oriented to what's going on. But Rabelais' novel, um, which is called Gargantua and Pantagruel, it's this massive novel about a giant and his son. And it's really just their escapades. It's highly episodic. It's the two of them and then various characters who come in and out just getting into scrapes and getting out of scrapes. And it's it's a highly, it's a comedic novel. Um, it's really raunchy. It's all about the body. So it's about overeating, overdrinking, poop, farts, 
defecation, all this stuff, lots of sex, lots of bodily humor, but all in this, um, in this really strange way. And it's, it's something that we don't really have a context for anymore because when, when moderns think about the body, it's, it's either as a hedonistic pleasure loving thing, or it's a, a bit more of an austere, we have to reject the body and overcome it thing. But within the Renaissance, um, they just thought about their bodies differently. And there was this idea that the body and particularly laughing about the body. So just making fun of bodily acts and happenings that there was something regenerative and restorative in that. So Rabelais was a physician, um, besides being a novelist, he was a doctor and he kind of got famous for reviving the Hippocratic notion that laughter is the best medicine. So he would just go and make his patients laugh and they would get better because he really believed that laughing had a healing power for the body and the soul. Hmm. Really interesting fellow would definitely recommend reading up on him, but it's, it's frankly going to be difficult for a modern reader to just pick up Rabelais and start reading him. Um, you mm -hmm. kind of have to do a lot of work to get into his world. And then the book really flows. It's kind of like the Canterbury Tales. I see. When you start reading the Canterbury Tales, you think, what is going on? And then you really get into it and it makes a lot of sense. Well, he's a very body character in this play, kind of a, kind yes. of a, the most like overtly degenerate, you know, um, and uh, although, you know, John Calvin has some problems of his own and Ignatius, not not in the same way. He's 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 he's, you know, not not the mature saint uh, that we that we know, you know, he, he became. But um, uh, OK, so so they they come across this body. It's Rabelais who who leads them to this body in an alley. Um, and, uh, the play, uh, seems to be more about their, from there seems to be less plot driven and more just about their various reactions to the situation that they find themselves in. Um, would that be a fair description? Yeah, that's certainly true. It, it is, um, it's, it, I think, I think to say that it's not plot driven is, fair because not actually a lot happens in it but hopefully it's interesting even yeah though it definitely is there yeah. isn't a ton of action yeah it's definitely interesting and one of the interesting things about the play is the language this is a verse play um i remember in the talk back after the performance you you mentioned that you know you had made a point of uh, making sure this is period language but put together in a way that is accessible to mm -hmm. uh, a modern audience um, that, you know, that is sort of legible in, though, I mean, we're hearing it, but you, in, in, you know what I mean? Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, very interesting. And you, and you also mentioned that these characters all speak in their own verse forms. Could you tell me about that? Sure. Yeah. So as I was writing, they, they actually all sort of started doing this on their own and then I just crystallized it. Um, they don't do it all the time, but whenever one of them gets a speech or gets, you know, speaks for more than more than three or four lines, they sort of fall into this this pattern. So their characteristic patterns are um, John Calvin speaks in blank verse. So it's it's highly metered, but there's no rhyme, there's no alliteration. He actually often goes out of his way to avoid rhyme and alliteration. Hmm. And then when he gets really worked up, he actually just speaks in metered prose. So it's not it's not broken up in in lines. Hmm. Um, Ignatius speaks in iambic tetrameter, which is tetrameter is sort of a more traditionally martial form. A lot of war songs and ballads are in tetrameter, so it's a very stirring form. It marches right along. And then he also alliterates strongly. So he almost has an Anglo-Saxon alliterative style where he's got a caesura in the middle of a line and then alliterations on the out around that caesura, mm. which um, I think that kind of I'm not 100% sure why he does that, but I think it's because he's looking for patterns, but he's not he's he's not uh, he's not rigid. Um he was a, he's an interesting character and his speech was interesting to write. So I think that's why he alliterates. I'm not sure he might just like it. Um mm -hmm. he might just enjoy speaking that way. 
Well, there's and something vigorous Rabelais. about that alliteration in the Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know. Yeah. There's a lot of force behind it and it allows you to, it allows you to be rhetorical. So you, you, you guide your listener to the important themes and words without having to spell it out. Right. And Ignatius kind of likes that. He right. doesn't like to make his point too strongly. Right. Yeah. And then Rabelais speaks in I um iambic pentameter and rhyming couplets. So okay. he'll just get going and he just is rattling off rhymes in couplets. And then he often has internal rhymes as well. And he's the one who I noticed the most being in verse just because he's the one who rhymes the, the, the most, you know, as I was listening yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he runs away with them sometimes. Sometimes he, he, he just gets himself into a mess with his rhymes where he's not really even making sense anymore, but it rhymes. So it feels like it makes sense. <laughs> right. Um, is there any uh, segment you could read for us to give us a, a, an idea of the voices of these three characters? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, I will read from Jean first, um, and then Ignatius, and then Rabelais. So we'll go from sort of least formal to most formal. So Jean says at one point um, when he's being confronted with a secret sin, um, he says, it is not, he's speaking of forgiveness. He says, it is not man's I crave, but still, if any trace remains in man of God, may not man's forgiveness to show his, however scant. I've confessed, oh, often alone and to a priest and by the altar, and not once has my burden lighted anywhere but square on me. How could it harm to offer what I've done to you? my soul's own devils in the flesh. So that's strongly metered, but it's blank first. There's no rhyme guiding it. Then Ignatius, um, let me find, here we go. Here he's speaking to the dead body. And this is actually a, ref I wanted to show here Ignatius sort of coming to a realization of the Ignatian spiritual practice of imaginative meditation and imaginatively placing yourself in a scene mm -hmm. and just being present. Um, cause I thought that was such an interesting contrast with his early life of action. And then Ignatian spiritual practice is, it is active. You are working, but in your imagination and your body is still, which is such an interesting contrast in his development as a person. So here he's sitting with, <clears throat> with the body and he says, what action can I perform? What exploit interpose for you? I, who've always had something to give, have nothing. I can only offer now to stay beside you quietly and in this time and place, unmoving, present here in mind, body, and imagination. I give the best I have, a lack of action, which is for me, death. And for you bring all my force to bear at last on this last thing, on being still. So that's Ignatius. And then here's good old Rabelais. Um, this is my favorite passage from the, this is from his final speech. And he says, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's long. Um, but yeah, he says here, I will read, I'll read this part. Love wisdom, say I, but not with what's above. She's a pretty girl and ripe. Love her with your body, your skin and bones, the gurgle of your gut. Love her with your rutting heart. And he goes on to say, Muck we are to muckiest muck, we shall return. But we, unlike the rest of all muck's children, we alone can jest. So you can hear he lands squarely on those rhymes. He doesn't worry about and jamming them gently. He'll just knock out rhyme after rhyme after rhyme. And he mm -hmm. thinks it's very fun. Right. Okay. Well, it's interesting that you pointed out, you know, going from less formal to most formal with with Rabelais being the most formal because of the characters, he is the least 
formal. And you could say John yes. Calvin <laughs> is the most sort of regimented uh, character um, with Ignatius being sort of perhaps in the middle between them in, in, in some ways. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, what, what do you make of that? The, the fact that, uh, that, that it's sort of an, a paradox there. Um, I don't know. I think, I think it just worked out that way. It's, it's funny when you make a piece of art like this and then people notice things about it and you think, oh, I, I didn't do that on purpose. Hmm. So I'm not exactly sure why it is that way. That's just the way it worked out. Rabelais would always speak most metered and rhymed. Um, yeah, I because think you, think, you talked about fun. it in terms of him having fun with it. Right. So yeah, you can I think, think of playing. you can think think of poetic forms in terms of it being more fun to have a, a strong mm-hmm. poetic form. You can also think of it in terms of order. So depending mm-hmm. on which 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 way you think of it, you know, it seems as though the you know John Calvin should be if he's the the one who's trying to be the most ordered ordered and strict, then maybe he's the one, or maybe Ignatius is the one who should be have the most sort of like yeah. strict uh, formal qualities in his verse, but. Um, that's interesting. Well, and I wonder too, because Rabelais' form is the most physical. Um, it's right. the form you heard the most. That's you even noticed true, yeah. that's the one you heard. And he's the most physical. He's right. looking for those those embodied meters that go with your heartbeat, that go with your pulse. So I I, I wonder if that's part of it too. Okay, so you, you decided to put these three characters together and see what happened. And I remember you also said in the talk back that you expected the uh, – you were surprised by how serious and sad the play was in performance compared to on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it is still funny in performance, but um, but uh, yeah. So, what were some of the ideas that sort of came out? I know you you don't necessarily start with ideas, but what were some of the concerns that came out when you put these three characters together? Um, I, guilt and innocence were a huge theme. Because whenever you put Calvin into a conversation, guilt is going to come up. Um, so, and he he kept pulling it back around to that. And the other two have really very different understandings of guilt. Um, Ignatius, and and it's mostly how how damned are we? I think is the question that the three of them are sort of circling around. Are we? Are we just hopelessly damned or is there something in our bodies that that belongs in heaven? Um, Because Calvin has this part where he's talking about St. Paul, St. Paul who says that he will cast off his body at the end of his life like a cloak. And Calvin says Mm. when he does this, he hopes he doesn't recognize anything that comes out of his body. Mm. And I think that's a pretty common understanding among modern Christians that that our lives, we're, we're living our lives and then we're going to just shed all of this and go someplace else. And I don't believe that at all. Um, mm. I think that the minute the heavens opened and Christ took his body into heaven, it became clear to us that that our bodies, they're not just here for the ride. They're actually the means of our salvation. We're not saved by what we do with our minds. We're saved by what we do in our bodies. And I think um, I think that Rabelais knows that better than the other two. Whether he whether he lives it out, <laughs> I think you can ask, but he understands that these bodies are eternally significant. These bodies, not just the body as a concept, but the actual bodies that we're living in are very important. So I think those were some of the issues that came up. And I, and I don't try to approach my artist saying, oh, what's relevant? How's this going to come up against a contemporary issue? Right. But it also just happens that way where I'm a contemporary person, so I'm aware of contemporary things. And I right. think the question of our bodies is, th- that's the question of our time. What, what? Why do we have bodies? Why aren't we just computers? How so does what- that make us different? What made you decide to set this on Mardi Gras? I think it just happened. Um, I think I was writing along and, gosh, why did I set it on Mardi Gras? Let me think. Um, well, I mean, I think it just only it only made sense that way because Carnival is the feast of flesh. It's mm. the 
It's the turning from, it's, it's when we are not thinking of ourselves as dust to dust. We're thinking of ourselves as flesh, as something living and something. And then in Carnival, it's so interesting because we were consuming all of this flesh. And that's, um, that's, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do in the season of Carnival. You're supposed to eat the meat before it goes bad. So there's a, there's a seasonal reason that it's called Carnival as well. But it ties in so nicely with with the Eucharist of like we are consuming this flesh and it's a joyful feast. It's a it's a yeah. festival. And we don't really have that notion of, of the Eucharist or the Mass as a festival, mm-hmm. but we should. Um we've lost that. The the medieval. Yeah, well had maybe that. if we maybe if we I mean, I'm a f I'm don't get me wrong, I'm I'm a proponent as we're you know, the popes of the past hundred or more years of frequent communion. But maybe if we didn't receive communion as often, or if we did have to do had to do more fasting like we used to before yeah. receiving communion, then maybe it would be a kind of a different vibe with that. Yeah, we should definitely fast more. Um, but we're not going to fast more until our festivals make more sense. Because yeah. you don't fast just for kicks. You fast because there's a feast that you're not having right. and you hope to have. Okay, so this is something I wanted to ask because I read the preface uh, a while ago, earlier today, uh, the Mm -hmm. preface you wrote for the play, and you said uh, you thought Carnival was really important, the season of Carnival, um, as it used to be celebrated, and that you you can't really have the, the feast without the fast, and Carnival and Lent are sort of interdependent. But I thought, well, isn't that more like Easter and Lent? Like, isn't Carnival kind of like the the sort of like, crypto pagan <laughs> version mm-hmm. where you do the fe- the feast before the fast and whereas Easter I mean at least it used to have more of a practical pur- purpose when a we actually fasted during Lent and B mm-hmm. you needed to get rid-, rid of all that meat because you weren't going to be eating meat much at all during Lent you know yeah. um but but it's sort of in its spirit isn't it typically isn't it isn't it more that the fast should come first and then Easter is the more important Easter and Lent are in- interdependent rather than carnival and Lent yeah, sure. So I think part of the the answer there is Carnival is supposed to come after Christmas. So it's almost the it's An the extension, extension of Christmas. Okay. Christmas tide. So right. Um, because like it, used day, it used to be longer. It used to be longer. Yeah. Yeah. The first day of Carnival is February is um, January seventh, mm. and then it goes through whenever Mardi Gras is. And I think um, – Because there was no ordinary time, so. <laughs> yeah, there was no ordinary yeah. time. And I think that's a huge thing. If we if we go from, oh, you get your little feasts and then there's this massive swatch of ordinary time and then you get – so get this. In the 12th century, in most major European cities, a full three months of the year was carnival. Wow. So you spent 120 days – in festival season. Now, what did the religious authorities or the saints of these times, what what do they think of that? They never said anything against it. Okay. There isn't a record that that was frowned upon. Um, okay. And you have, actually, you have records of, you know, priests, not so much monks, but priests and bishops occasionally attending carnival events. So there is a right. sense in which... You don't want your carnivals to become hedonistic pagan frenzies. However, there's something about a hedonistic pagan frenzy that we should look at and say, hmm, why do we do that? Because everybody does that. Every civilization has a hedonistic pagan frenzy. (laughs) And there needs to be a way for Christianity to ask the question of why do we do that and find a way to bring it into alignment with the church in an appropriate way. And I don't know what that way is, um, but I do know that we're not doing it now, which is really interesting. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Well, it was interesting to see this play on Mardi Gras. I know there's, I should actually, I should mention for people in the New York area, well, there were originally two performances um, February 21st and March 1st, those both sold out. So now a third performance on March 8th has been added. And um, I don't know if there's still tickets available for, available for that, but I'll put the link in the show notes so that people in the New York City area can actually look at that. Um, it's in Midtown Manhattan. Um, so if, if you can, I would recommend going. Um, 
But uh, it was interesting to see the premiere on Fat Tuesday because, especially because Ignatius gives this very stirring monologue at the end, um, where where Fat Tuesday Shrove Tide is ending, and of course it's Shrove Tuesday because I guess um, I don't know that much about this, but my my, my assumption is it was customary to go to confession at yeah. the very beginning or right before Lent. Yeah. You wanted to be shriven before Lent, yeah. Yeah, so he hears the bells for matins ringing, and um, this this beautiful. I'll read a little bit of his monologue here. Okay, um, I might make mistakes because I've never actually uh, read it on the page before, but I, I just <laughs> <okay>. found it. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. The bells of Shrove Tide's ending. Lent, the long, the silent sigh of Lent comes close behind. Listen, matins bells are ringing, brother. Cold will dawn this day, and red and dreary light casts full upon the face of foes hid within the ranks. This is the summons, friend. The bells call us to confession now, before the feast is ended. Me, I count this night a dearly bought revelation, realization. I see pride, flightiness, and fright driving wild the bright chariots of our souls. Long, long I've slept, long endured anxious dreams, thrashed in throes of my own dignity, and now, bereft of pride, marked for arrest, I wake, and waking I exult. Sleepers, hark, hear the bells. What the night that brings such light can be called black? Hear the bells. It is my summons, the trumpet sounds, my general calls, the battle's well begun. Whatever comes, I know where my first loyalty is owed, to God's church who bids me now make haste to be well shrived. From there, whatever comes is good. Listen, haste, the fast is at the door. So he, And then he just sort of runs off. <laughs> <laughs> and Rabelais is left for that, that last speech, which you quoted. Um, but yeah, I love that. That was such a sweet thing to hear. I'm glad. Uh, right before Lent starts, you know? I like that speech too. Yeah, that was a yeah. a fun one. Yeah, good stuff. So um, uh, another thing, another passage I really liked, it's the, it's the dialogue about beauty. Um, mm. They've discovered that the, the dead body um, is the body of a woman. Um, it's specifically of, of a prostitute who's been murdered. And um, Ignatius also, well, you know what? I don't want to spoil this too much, so I don't want to contextualize it too much. But the dialogue about um, beauty, Ignatius says, all things beautiful are also frail. The least brush with ugliness spoils them forever. The good can withstand grim battle with evil. Truth can wrestle chest to chest with lies, yet beauty must have champions. She cannot wage her war alone. For her to enter the struggle is to lose. And I know this isn't really the context of the lines, but immediately when I heard that, what it made me think of is the debate over the role of art in like politics mm -hmm. and sort of like social life that we have mm -hmm. today. And the idea that for, for her to enter the struggle is to lose, that's one possible point of view, which is that, you know, art should never be used for sort of these extraneous you know, mm -hmm. purposes of cultural combat, things like that. Now, I think yeah. that's probably an oversimplification, but there's a lot of truth to it. Um, but then Rabelais says something. Now, there I don't agree. Rather, you've got it all backwards. She's a scrappy one. Beauty, the merest trace of beauty, countermands the worst of things and seals for them a spot in paradise, if only cleaning out the pot. Um, and then John freaks out and, you know, says beauty doesn't have anything to do with the situation we're in. Um but yeah, interesting. I mean, because because he's right as well, because beauty does seem to I mean, beauty is easily put to foul purposes as well. Mm -hmm. So so it can go both ways. But yeah, there's a point there. There is really something about finding beauty in uh, a difficult spot that is especially precious. I remember walking, taking a walk in my old neighborhood um, in the west of Harlem uh several years ago on a winter night and just and it was just kind of bleak and gloomy and and i just came across this like this small playground that was like covered with snow and the lights mm -hmm. were shining on it everything else was kind of dark but there were these lights lighting up the playground and the snow was just sort of like gleaming and i was just like wow that's mm -hmm. like such i was so happy to to come a come upon that you know yeah um so you know it's interesting to see them i think they're both right in a way I think they are too. I mean, I think that's why they each get a speech on this topic. And I think John might actually be right a little bit too. Um, hmm. The the, yeah, the questions right. in the play are not questions that I want to take a definite stand on. Um, 
more I I think I just want to raise them and raise them in a in a lovely and, and playful like linguistically playful way so that people can have these conversations a little with a little more clarity maybe well right after that there's this 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 little bit by Rabelais which kind of speaks to that um because John uh you know has his objection to their their points about beauty and Rabelais says see this just isn't fair Plato would never have allowed dialogue like this the danger of a three-way conversation is too acute the dialectic loses its all its force the third to speak will always seem to have the final word how does one knock the third's thickness? If we ignore it, by convention it stands, but by responding we, mu we would launch a new round of dialectic that must wind again its triple orbit, and that takes far too long for any normal patience. Never again shall I speak with two others. From henceforth I shall always demand either one or three interlocutors, and should I find myself in such a bag as this, I will demand either that one depart or a fourth join us. What am I to do with such an idiot speech as that? Respond or change the subject and let you presume, abetted by the laws of discourse, that you have bested us? All I can do is laugh, but that response would be disordered at this time and place. So against my judgment, I defer to you only by my silence. But do not tempt me more. And then John says, if that is your rebuke in silence, spare us your rebuke in speech. Um, but it's interesting because Rabelais actually is the one who gets the last word. Um, yep in the play and we're not to assume that uh that that means his perspective is the is the complete one or the or the right yeah. one yeah no we're definitely not to assume that but we are to note that the other two the other two left the field um for reasons good or bad depending on your perspective and rabelais remained in the world which is an accurate depiction of what happened historically um Rabelais remained in the Catholic Church. He never left, but he remained as a as a deep critic. Um, he mm -hmm. he agreed with the reformers' criticisms of the church. So he found himself banned by Catholics and denounced by Protestants. Um, and actually, Calvin wrote this letter years years after this play is set. Um, specifically against Rabelais, calling out Rabelais. It was sort of an open letter the way they used to write things back then and just excoriating Rabelais both for his writing and for his decision to remain in the church. So he hmm. said, you write these terrible novels that no one should read because they're so filthy and you see that the church is corrupt and you won't leave it. <laughs> it's, it's such a fascinating... He, Rabelais is just such a fascinating character for his... Um, he, he just sticks with the world in a way that I think a lot of us might be tempted to say, oh, he should have, he should have been a purist, you know, he should have either left the church or he should have, you know, started some sort of counter-reformation revolt, but he didn't, he didn't do either. He really tried to, he really tried in his own way to, to speak a truth that was difficult to say. Also, I think uh, the impression I get is that he would have found that very boring. Oh, yeah, to become, it would be very dull. Yes. <laughs> to, to go and start some <laughs> kind of movement. Um, but, uh, but. Um, oh, yeah, no, he was definitely not oh, an administrator on. interested in movements. <laughs> right. Um, by the way, um, it's a testament to your, I mean, the last two sections I just read, I'd never actually read before I've heard them in the play, but. But it's a testament to the clarity and legibility of your verse that I was able to just like gallop through those and it was oh, pretty glad. easy to find my way through it, you know, because I wouldn't be able to do that with just just anything. Um, yeah. Well, it's a fun thing to do if anybody listening has a flair for these things. It's fun to just get a couple copies of this and sit around and do a dramatic reading. Um, we have a yeah. lot of friends who've done that and they've yeah. had a blast. Yeah, no, it is fun. Even if you're not a pro even if you're not putting on a production, it could just be like literally a social. Yeah. You know, I went I went to a thing once where some actors uh, were reading. Um, actor friends were doing a reading of The Lion in Winter. I think is the name of it. Mm, lovely. Um, and yeah. uh, and and at my 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 friend uh, James, uh, who was going to go see the the play later on, uh, oh, he good. he. Uh, he kindly i forget what character he was playing one of the main ones he he was very nice and after this the 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 intermission he he kindly let me take his part and read the second oh, half fun. it was really fun 
Um, it is such a fun thing to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you actually mentioned in the talk back that to you, this this dead prostitute sort of represented the state of the church in in her in her human element at this time yeah. in the 1520s. Yeah, it was. It, um, I, I I had that thought, and I thought, oh man, I don't know if I can think of the church in that way. I don't know if that's allowed. And then I was reading um, the visions of Saint Hildegard of Bingen, and she actually had a vision um, of the church as a prostitute. And the vision is very, like, very rough, where she, like, the church is actually raped by the devil and impregnated, and it is rough. And it was wow. interesting to read that and realize that this thought that I had, I mean, in this vision that Hildegard had was sanctioned by the church as um, something that, you know, Catholics could could meditate on. Um, so that, that made me feel a little better about it, because I, I was pretty... I just didn't know if I was disrespecting my mother, you know, um, right. but I don't think it is. I think it's, I think it's being honest about the the two natures of the church. Um, the church is an earthly institution in many ways, but it is also a divine institution. And I think we need to be able to, to see it as both, both ways. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, find the people who put this play on the the director and the actors. Question. So I, we did. Okay. I finished writing the play January, 2021. Um, and then, and I'd really, really written it with several friends in mind. When I, when I set out to do a creative work, I usually have two or three friends in mind. And I think if they like this, they're like the best people I know, if they like it, I'm going to be happy with it. So I, I gave it to the people I'd written it for and said, this is a gift. I hope you like it. And they did like it. And they wanted to do a staged, like a dramatic reading of it over Zoom. So we put that together. We did that in March 2021. If anyone out there is working on a script, I so strongly recommend that you do a dramatic reading. It's so helpful. Um, and if you need help figuring out how to do that, just look up my website, email me, and I can help you with it because it is very, very helpful to figure out if your script is working or not. Hmm. So we did that. The script was working. We made a couple changes, but not a lot. And then I just started um, sort of sending it out to people. And I sent it to my college, um, the King's College in New York, just to see if their theater group might want to do it. And they weren't doing any plays that year, not in a new place. And but they sent it to their um, their theater graduates, and one of them grabbed it and thought it would be really fun to direct. So I got to work with him. We were going to be doing a staged reading. It wasn't going to be a full production. But then when Wise Blood picked it up, they really graciously offered to help us make it a full production. And that's, that's why we got to see what we saw on Tuesday. <laughs> so that's thanks, cool. I'm huge sure that's exciting for them to get into a new a new area. You know, I think well. so. Well, and something really fun is this was Connor's directorial debut in New York, the director, and it was one of the actors New York debut as well, which mm. I just thought was so neat to have. It's my first play. Um, it was just fun to have a lot of people really doing something that was new for them. Um, and I thought right. it, it, I just thought it turned out so well with, there was just a lot of passion and joy from the actors yeah, yeah, and the yeah. director. And yeah, I was just really thankful to all of them for taking a risk on it. Yeah. Okay. So then that leads me to my other question, which is um, about your background. I, I'm not familiar with, I, I mean, I'm familiar with you on Twitter and then this play and, that, and that's <laughs> it. So so your background, you said it's your first play. So your background is as a poet. Just tell me about mm -hmm. your your background as an artist in general. Sure. So I'm, a, I'm primarily a poet. I write a lot of criticism and essays and things like that, but, but I'm primarily a poet. Um, in my graduate work, I really fell in love with the the dramatic monologue form, mm -hmm. which is sort of an older form, um, kind of reached its zenith with Robert Browning. And then you see it pop up here and there, but it's not wildly popular, but I really, really liked it. Right. And I thought it was a fun form because it lets you be more philosophical in your verse without getting didactic. Because um, you're, you're getting to put your ideas into the voices of other people, usually historical characters or something like that. Um, and when you're doing that, you're, you have to 
fit your ideas to that character. So it's got a dram- it's got a very dramatic element to it. So I loved that form. Um, work I work in it a lot. I've published a lot of dramatic monologues. Um, I've published one from the point of view of Penelope um, after Odysseus leaves again or U- Ulysses leaves again at the end of his life. She kind of lets him have it a little as his ship sails away. Um, I've got one about the widow of Cana, um, who's the woman from the wedding at Cana, but after the crucifixion. A um, couple of others out there. So I loved that form. And then when it came time to write this, um, I knew I wanted to write it. I thought maybe it was a novel, tried it as a novel that didn't work. And it just really quickly became clear it was supposed to be a play. It, it needed to be spoken. It wasn't something that was going to live on the page permanently. So I think buy the book, read the book, but read it aloud with friends. It's not supposed to be a static piece of art. And then since doing this, I've really fallen in love with performing art. I'm, I'm, I want to work in this more. Mm. Just having your work spoken and partnering with other creative artists and stuff has just been really fun. So that's, oh, the other thing I did that was really fun and you might actually like it. Um, I did a translation of The Dream of the Rude for the Lamp magazine. Um, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to with, read that. Yeah. Oh, okay. You should check it out. It it was so fun to do. I did it with a dear friend, Tessa Carmen, who was actually there on Tuesday. She and I worked on it together and we just had the loveliest time working through this poem from the Anglo-Saxon and we wanted to... We wanted to do a translation that had the poetic force, the 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 aural poetic force of the original as far as we could. Um, we just had such a good time working on that. So definitely check that out. And it's also a series of dramatic monologues. Interestingly, it's nested dramatic monologues, which I actually Great. didn't think of till Great. now. Yeah. So that's what I do. Um, I'm working on a couple of other things, but nothing nothing major is completed yet. Jane, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, congrats Thanks again on me. this premiere. It's really cool. Thank you. I'm just, I'm so delighted that people are enjoying it. Like I said, I wrote it as a gift for friends and it's really fun that it's going out further than that. It's it's just a delight to see. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to help us continue uh, making these podcasts, please go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio I will link to uh, to Jane's play, the where you can buy the text, as well as get tickets for the final performance on March 8th in the show notes for today's episode. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.